Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly 90 minute deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Dave. I'm a parent of a daughter in college, and we live in Chicago, Illinois. My name is Lisa. I'm a clinical psychologist and a college counselor. I am a parent of a boy in elementary school, a girl in middle school, and a girl in college. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHealthToday.com. And Joy is graduate of the University of Georgia, and she is getting her master's degree at North Carolina State University. This week in the news, check this box if you are a good person. A great article by Rebecca Sobke of the New York Times. Our questions from a listener are these. How often do schools rescind their offers of admission based on academics? If a student has one grade slip, will that be the basis to rescind? Should students who apply ED be encouraged to apply to several schools EA so they have an acceptable backup if something crazy happens with a rescinded offer of admission from an ED school? These questions are from Shauna from North Dakota. Our interview is part two of two with Chris Peterson and Kellen Manning, two MIT admission officers on Understanding MIT. And there will be no college spotlight as Chris Peterson and Kellen Manning's 25-minute conversation of MIT is the college spotlight for the day. Good morning, friends. Every week, I, with great alacrity and excitement, look forward to coming here. And I am excited. Sunday morning, bright and fresh outside. Dave and I have a lot to share with you. But before we dive in, a couple announcements. So one of them, and we're going to be talking about this coming up, uh, particularly in episode 222, but Couple schools were busted for falsifying rankings. Uh, USC, pretty bad over five years. And uh, Columbia hasn't quite been busted yet, but it's been exposed in a major, major way. We'll be discussing uh, an article that was just released in the Washington Post as a Columbia professor blew the whistle on how they've been scamming US news for a very, very, very long time. And the data is pretty compelling. So uh, look forward for a discussion on that coming up in episode 222. Also, some more news moving on the test score front. Um, the Cal State University system, which is actually the largest uh, four-year state-based system in the country, they had been, uh, they had not considered test scores just during the pandemic. And they have made the decision to permanently go test blind and basically uniting the Cal State system with the UC system. UC system says they're doing it through 20, 20, 24, 25, and then taking a look. But looks like uh, the new rollout of the online simplified FAFSA is not swaying over the people in California. And then, I guess better late than never, but a bonehead move by Georgia. Georgia was one of the few states in the country that was still requiring test scores during the pandemic. Well, guess what? They never listened to the admission directors at the 26 USG University System Georgia schools who would tell them we're getting killed by people's inability to take the test or the fact that they have so many other options at other places that are not requiring it. And so finally, after screaming enough, they said, we're sitting here with tons and tons of applicants that would be completely complete without test scores. On March 23rd, Dave, they say no test scores required for fall of 22 applicants. Not for not for not for fall of 23. All people that have been applying since August wow. at all but three of the most selective USG schools in the state, that being University of Georgia, Georgia Tech, and Georgia College. Those three have to submit scores. Of course, everybody's already been <laughs> accepted already. A pretty bonehead admission that they made a bad mistake. I guess you could say better late than never, but what a mess. So those those are a couple announcements. Now, admissions tip, and this one may surprise you. There is an additional information section that a lot of people don't know about that's part of the writing section in the common application. I did a full interview with Amin Gonzalez, Director of Admission at Wesleyan University, on this additional information section that I encourage you to go back and listen to. But here's my tip. I believe 95% of students should use this section. 
And I consistently ask admission officers what percentage of people use that section. And I hear numbers from 10%. The highest I've ever heard is 50. It is a missed opportunity uh, to use that section. Now, what do you use it for? Well, I'm not going to cover all the reasons. Go listen to the interview for that. But there's a lot of things. Like if there's some irregularity, maybe a very bizarre grade that seems, you know, low grade, that seems completely out of whack compared to your transcript. There may be a very, very good reason for that. Maybe your grandmother passed away. Uh, a, a bizarre curriculum decision. Why did you take Latin one, two, three, and then you dropped it? Well, maybe it's because the teacher left or because it conflicted with another course that you had to take. There's just so many different, three schools in three years. That would always be something, you know, I was, when we were at admissions, we used to sh- scratch our heads, three schools in three years, this person just moving around a lot, what's going on? There may be very good reasons for that. And there might have been an opportunity for you not to fully use the the activity section to really bring out something you feel really, really passionate about. And you need more than 150 characters to really express how strongly you feel. So there's just so many reasons and ways to use that section. Don't let that be a missed opportunity. So that's my tip. All right, Dave. Vernacular. All right. I don't expect you to get it. So you can always... Take a test optional pass. All right. The word is dualism. What do admission officers mean when they say dualism? Dualism. I told you it was a toughie. This is PhD level stuff, man. It means that they're fighting over an applicant, so they're about to do a duel. <laughs> are you gonna are you gonna pull a 1970s movies reference or John Wayne or something on me? <laughs> it's like I'm gonna have my candidate. You have a choice. Between a sword or a flintlock, it's dualism. <laughs> I I feel like I need to give you an A for creativity on this one. <laughs> so so I'm actually happy to talk about this. So you know we've talked a lot about terms, and if you're new to the podcast, you may not know these terms. But all these terms I'm going to use are terms. Uh, Dave knows all of them for an applicant that goes very, very, very deep in a particular area. So sometimes that person's called the angular student. Sometimes they're called well lopsided. Sometimes they're called pointy or spiky. These are all terms to describe someone who kind of goes, almost a specialist who goes very, very deep in an area of passion. We've often said that that can be a way to stand out in an applicant pool. But there is another side to this, and that is colleges love multi versatile applicants who have left brain and right brain, the kid who loves to code but also has a passion for theater, the kid who loves to do dance but also does biomed research. And they'll, when they see that, they'll be like, dualism. You're doing the left brain and the right brain. So there's – there's. does that make sense, Dave? Oh, absolutely. I, I know it well. That, that Absolutely. That was your daughter in a lot of ways. And by the way, Yale is one place that really loves that. Yes, it Just did. like liberal arts colleges in general tend to like it a lot. And Yale is a place that really loves to see like you've gone you've gone deep in areas that almost seem to have not necessarily natural correlation with each other. Theater and computer science. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and there's lots of combinations, you know, but yeah, it's yeah. just in fact, um, even a place like MIT, like why is it that MIT requires a uh, recommendation from math science, and then they also require another one from either English history, foreign language. They want to, they're trying to kind of test that dualism a little bit there. And, and actually, there is there is a neuroscientific correlation because we know that many people who are prodigies in music are also highly advanced in abstract mathematics. So that makes sense there from a neuroscientific point of view. You would come with doctor stuff on me, man. <laughs> By the way, I should ask you, what's the view in the emergency room these days? What are you seeing? Not so much COVID. We don't care uh-huh. about COVID anymore. Get vaccinated <laughs> or die. We don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a true doctor who takes the Hippocratic Oath. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I'm in Chicago. So, you know, it's the start of the shooting season. <laughs> oh, boy. So we are, we are, the guns are back and forth. And, and now all the criminals are, can legally wear masks. So they're happy. <laughs> 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 okay, whatever floats your boat. All right, the big number, 3.75 billion, and that was a B, billion, so this is truly a big number. So you probably heard me mention NCAN before. It's a very, very passionate access organization. Um, used to be called National College Access Network, and it, the acronyms have changed for it, but basically it's what they are. 
Uh, they issued a report this week that says people are leaving $3.75 billion on the table just by not completing the FAFSA just from the Pell Grant. Now, the Pell Grant is money strictly from the Department of Education. This is government money for families of who are regarded as under-resourced. And in fact, this number is so high and it's so concerning, and this has been something NCAN has really been pushing through legislation. They've been really successful. There's a growing trend for states to require FAFSA must be completed as a graduation requirement. So this actually started in Louisiana in 2017-18, and it was so successful, Louisiana vaulted from at the bottom of the list for FAFSA completers to all the way to the top in the country. Others, other states took note. And now you're seeing it start to go, like Texas in 21-22 uh, passed legislation. Illinois actually did it in 2021, Dave. Colorado's doing it this up and coming year, 22-23. Alabama, 21-22. And, and then we also have New Hampshire is going to do it in 23-24. And Maryland, 22-23. So in some states, the enforcement's a little weak. Sometimes they're kind of relying on local agencies. And, uh, you know, sometimes the bite, what's the statement? The bark is bigger than the bite. Um, but there's an attempt to make this a mandatory graduation requirement because, you know, it's almost like it's almost like you have to force people to wear a seatbelt to decrease accidents. You got to force people to do something that's in their best interest to unlock some of the millions of dollars that are there that primarily impacts uh, families that are either significantly below national medians when it comes to income and assets or, or slightly below in order to qualify for the, for the Pell Grant. Um, you really, <clears throat> your assets and income need to be at the 90th percentile of the, of the national medians. So Dave, we got an article I'm super excited about. It's more of an op-ed than anything else, but uh, take it away, my friend. And now it's time for Hot Topics in the News. Yes. Okay. So this is Rebecca Sabki of the New York Times. This is an article that was actually written in 2017, but it's current for every single year. So I'm glad that we are looking at it. And it is uh, this check this box if you're a good person. And it starts off by Rebecca Sabki saying that she's worked in undergraduate missions at Dartmouth College for many years. She used to be the director of international admissions, and in 2017, she was still working part-time after having a baby. She said every year she'd read over 2,000 college applications from students all over the world. She found that the applicants were always intellectually curious and talented. They climbed mountains. They had extracurricular clubs. They developed new technologies. They were, quote, the next generation leaders. Their accomplishments stack up. But the problem was with the deluge of such incredible promising candidates, many students, quote, become indistinguishable from one another, at least on paper. She said, quote, it is incredibly difficult to choose whom to admit. Yet in the chaos of SAT scores, extracurriculars, and recommendations, one quality is always irresistible in a candidate. And her shocking thought was it was kindness. She said it's a trait that would be hard to pinpoint on applications, even if colleges ask the right questions. But every so often, this trait can't help but shining through. She started the article with a little anecdote about when she was running uh, from to the parking lot after going to one of these high school information sessions. And a student ran after her and tapped her on the shoulder and basically said, oh, you know, you dropped something. And uh, she said, excuse me, ma'am, you dropped a granola bar on the floor in the cafeteria. I chased you down since I thought you'd want a snack. And before she could even thank him, he handed me the bar and dissolved into the sea of strangers. So this was just someone doing a kind turn. But that in itself really expressed on her how these little acts of kindness really speak to someone's character. And then she talks about an even more impactful uh, situation when they had a student who chose as one of her high school recommendations 
a recommendation from the school janitor. Actually, they called him the custodian, but in our neighborhood, it's the janitor. <laughs> <laughs> Break it down. <laughs> That's right. And the janitor, uh, and I'll just quote this. The custodian wrote that he was compelled to support the student's candidate because of his thoughtfulness. This young man was the only person in the school who knew the names of every member of the janitorial staff. He turned off lights in empty rooms, consistently thanked the hallway monitor each morning, and tidied up after his peers, even if nobody was watching. This student, the custodian wrote, had a refreshing respect for every person at the school, regardless of the position, popularity, and clout. Now, I was impressed because I can tell everybody now, I wasn't going to ask my janitor for a recommendation. (laughs) (laughs) But this was so shocking and so refreshing to this admission community, and I I assume it was Dartmouth because that's where this person works, that 100% of the committee voted to admit this particular student. And so the article just makes the point that in a sea of accomplishments, at a time when we look at everything from SAT scores to climbing mountains to all these amazing things, that to pinpoint the mere uh, act or quality of kindness can be one of the most impactful things a student can do in advancing his college career. So let me stop there, Mark, and throw it open to you, my custodial friend <laughs> <laughs> well first of all i know i say this a lot but that, that, that was a plus 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 summary so thank you for that you totally totally nailed it up and nailed that and described every key point in that article so yeah it's very rare dave and i'll go back to something that was written literally almost five years ago but this is as relevant today as it was at the time it was written and um I really like Becky Sobke. She's someone I'll be referring to her coming up in in some future episodes, but I find her to be a very insightful voice explaining how this admission process works. Uh, She uses a power story very, very effectively and just communicates with uh, uh, a level-headedness, and she's trying to tamp down the noise and help people make matches in this process. So happy to uh, elevate her a little bit as a voice I think our, our listeners should familiarize themselves with. Um, this is really profound and it profoundly impacted her to the point where of all the letters she's read, like this, this one stood out. Like she literally, and I've heard her tell the story. She literally started writing major, you know, newspapers and things sharing this story because it impacted her so much. And then, uh, you know, the New York times picked it up as an op-ed and ran with it. Several things I want to point out. First of all, don't miss what she said. It's really hard, especially in highly selective pools, to stand out. Uh, here's a quote from the article. The problem is that in a deluge of promising candidates, many remarkable students become indistinguishable from one another, at least on paper. It's incredibly difficult to choose who to admit with SAT scores sky high, extracurricular accomplishments and recommendations all looking amazing. So, you know, have a little sympathy for the admission office job. It's just brutally hard um, for, for, for admission officers in that context. And, you know, what I try to do in this podcast is try to take a look at where there's a disconnect between what I see people thinking, feeling, believing based on my counseling that I do and how admissions operates. And what I experience, Dave, almost on a weekly basis is someone gets a new test score that's a little better than their previous one. Maybe it's 30 or 60 points higher on an SAT or one or two or three points higher on an ACT. And they want to know if it's good enough. The implication is, is this the magic bullet I need to get me in? Um, and, And I'm here to say that it's oftentimes not those things. It's very, very hard to separate yourself from the glut of high accomplishments and selective pools by a few more points on a test score. It's it's these little things, though, these outside-the-box things that can make a difference. And one of the reasons I wanted to discuss this is I did want to underscore the value of personal qualities. At the end of the day in admissions, you're building a class, and you're very mindful of the fact that 
yeah, students, we're an academic institution. So what you do in the classroom matters. You need to have the heft. You need to be able to hang, handle, not just handle the rigor, but hopefully contribute to the education of others because we're an academic institution. But we're very mindful that a full academic load of 15 credit hours leaves another 153 hours in the week. And what are you going to be like in the dorm? And what are you going to be like over the dining room? And what are you going to be like on the weekend? And so you're, you're looking for kids who will add that extra something special to elevate your culture. And I loved her two stories. The cool thing about the granola bar story is that the kid dashed off before she could say thank you. Because earlier in the article, she talks about everybody's always running up to me. So here's what Sopke says. When I give information sessions at high schools, I'm used to getting swarmed by students as soon as my lecture ends. They run up to me. They hand me their resumes. They're fighting for my attention so that, so that they can tell me about their internships. They can tell me about their summer science projects. And so she's used to that. And what made the granola bar power story powerful is that the kid clearly wasn't looking for this to be some foray into acceptance because the kid didn't even stay around for her to even find out, what's your name, young man? Tell me more about you. So that's what gave that some substance. And then, of course, we have this powerful story from the what's the, what term are we going with, Dave? Janitor. The janitor. <laughs> the janitor. <laughs> the janitor. I'm fancying up with the custodian, right? The cust- Just keep it real. The custodian. <laughs> <laughs> and this is powerful. Now, now you know, I was going to say, in the inner city, the custodian sounds like the cop. <laughs> <laughs> Patrol in the hallways. No, we go to the janitor. <laughs> Everybody gets that one. I have to admit. Janitors keeps it real. So, so the interesting thing about this is, I get probably about four or five people a year, Dave, that will say, now it's never the student, it's always the parent, always. They'll be like, we kind of know someone who, and it's like a senator or some like kind of VIP person, you know? Um, sometimes it's a board of trustee member. Like, should we kind of try to pull that string? And I mean, this article talks about this, how many times you get letters from famous people. And and this is something else that I think is really important to, for people to understand. It's not how well the admission officer knows the rec writer. It's about how well the rec writer knows you. It's not about how famous the person is. I was having a conversation recently with someone who shared this with me, but somebody really famous that they know and and, um, and, you know, my question always is, do they, how well do they know your kid? Like, I'm not going to say an automatically a famous person automatically in all situations should never be used, but how well do they know your kid was my question. And then, um, I had a respondent, this happened in the last month, say, I'm, they would notice them on the elevator if they were on the elevator. I'm like, that's not going to cut it. <laughs> <laughs> noticing you in five, amongst five or six people on the elevator is not cutting it. How well do they know your kid? So um, I also think, and she acknowledges this there, okay? With the New York Times publishing this, there's a chance now hundreds of people are going to go get the janitor for next year's letter, right? So th- here's a quote from her. Next year, there might be a flood of custodian recommendations thanks to this essay. But if it means kids will start paying as much attention, you know, the people who clean their classrooms as they do to the principals and teachers, I'm happy to get that, help start that trend. So um, I also think that there's a lot that can be learned from this, and some of it can even be applied. Like, I'm not just saying to go out and mimic this. But it is something, if it makes sense, maybe it does make sense in certain instances, if you have somebody. Uh, I wouldn't exactly go for the janitor because this has uh, now been pretty public, but maybe the person who rides the bus, um, they're, they're the bus driver, like if it makes sense, you know. Um, the point I want to make is not necessarily just go mimic this because you got to be careful with quote unquote gimmicks. But what I do want to point out is sometimes if you're a little creative and you do something completely outside the box, it really can make an impression and really can make you stand out. 
and in a, in a, in a really competitive pool, sometimes a little creativity goes a long ways. What are your thoughts, Dave? I like it. I, I think it illustrates um, the, the qualities of character. And I, as she pointed out kindness and, and kindness can be manifested in many ways. I remember years back when uh, they were talking about great essays and one gentleman wrote about his experiences working in a diner in the summer. And, you know, when everybody's trying to impress and saying, I work for an investment firm or this and that, this guy was like, what I learned from the people working in an, in a diner every single day that changed my life. Um, we have it reflected in people who sometimes write about taking care of a family member that might be ill, babysitting for their uh, younger siblings, uh, taking care of a parent with an illness. Um, and once again, you know, the, the problem that you illustrate is, is, you know, the world is rife with gimmicks. I remember that one of the things I wrote about in, uh, medical school was going on a medical mission. And then it turned out five years later, you told me, you know, Oh, don't write about medical missions. Cause everybody does a medical mission. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the important thing, it, it has to be true to yourself. The fact is if it's a true experience to yourself, to the individual, if, if what you're writing about is a sincere reflection of who you are and what you learned, that sincerity will ring. So I, I wouldn't say don't worry about, oh, is there anybody else going to write about this experience? No, if this experience was true to you, write about it. But I think the point is is uh, trying to focus on some element of your character, of your goodness, of your kindness that shone through in any aspect of your life in your high school, whether through uh, extracurriculars, directly in the classroom, other things you might have done. And I think that that's the point that the article is about to make. It's not all about intellectual um, uh, bona fides, that, that the qualities of character count. Dave, that was fantastic. Because yeah. um, I didn't quite feel like I articulated what I was trying to say. I thought you did there better than I was trying to do. So first and foremost, I can't emphasize this enough. And I asked you this question once, and you got it right, Dave. What do you, what do you think? The biggest single thing in mission officers crave more than anything else. And you got it right. It's authenticity. And so when you're talking about be authentic, don't don't create some gimmick to try to mimic something that's not who you are. You'll, it'll it'll ring as it is. It'll ring as hollow. So I heard that in what you said. The character. The other thing I loved about what you said. Um, and when you gave examples like working in a diner, that that's fantastic. You know, one of the things I do a lot of times with with students and families I work with right now is I help them plan their summer activities, like what what makes sense for them to do on a personal level. And, you know, it's a complicated question because there's not a right or wrong. There's like so many different things that you can do in a summer. And of course, it depends on the interests of the kid and the resources of the family and what the kid wants to do and many other factors. But one of the things sometimes people are surprised to hear me say is just going and getting a job is a great thing. And it, and it doesn't have to be some fancy smancy job. It, it can be Wendy's McDonald's Starbucks. There's an aspect of that that schools like that there's not a lot of entitlement here, that you know what it's like in the real world, that you know how to earn a dollar, and you've been exposed um, to – you know, especially if it's someone coming from um, very upwardly mobile communities, you're exposed sometimes to another another sector that can 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 resonate as 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 a really good activity. It doesn't have to be something something um, you know incredibly impressive. Um, in fact, a lot of times those really impressive things, especially now, there's going to be someone in the mission office is going to say, "Did this person get this opportunity because of their unique resources?" That somebody else didn't get an opportunity to do. And are we, are we, are we being biased by being impressed that they, whatever they, you know, climbed down Everest or whatever they did? In other words, folks, if you're going to work in the diner, don't have your daddy buy the diner first. <laughs> <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> But, you know, honestly, though, it really can make a good essay. Like, you know, what what I what I what I learned flipping burgers at McDonald's for a summer, you know, um, if it's you know, if it's authentic and it's true. And of course, just the topic in itself doesn't doesn't make it stand out. It's going to be the substance and the content of, of what you bring out. But just to, to bring the whole thing um, to a close, Dave, character. Yeah. 
Right. It's that intangible. It's it's you know, I've 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 heard Sapke say this. People often say to her, you know, what is it that makes a student stand out when you meet them in person? Right. You know, and her answer is, you know it when you see it. Yeah. It's you know it when you see it. And that's that was this essay, right? Yeah. I'm I mean, I mean, what the custodian said? I mean, what more to to elevate somebody's character um, than I just want to read one last little bit of this because it was really powerful. So look at what this custodian says and think about what this says to an admission office. This young man was the only person in the school who knew the names of every member of the janitorial staff. Like what a powerful attestation to character. He turned off the lights in empty rooms. He consistently thanked the hallway monitor each morning. He tidied up after his peers, even if nobody was watching. Like, what a statement. Like, it, it's just, rec, admission officers do like it when rec writers point out superlatives. Right. Uh, this was the student I'd love to sit beside on the bus if we went on field trips. Or this was the student that challenged me and had me making sure I was going over my notes because I know they were going to challenge me. Like, they love that kind of thing. But they also love it when someone just extols character. And the other thing they like is examples. Yeah. This is concrete. If if the custodian would have just said, this student was very kind to me, it doesn't have its power. And so how can people use this? Well, I'm going to be talking a little bit more coming up in, in future episodes. Um, um, uh, about how you can have more influence on what your rec writers actually say is one way you can really stand out. Remember, admission officers only know what they read. They only know what's presented in paper. So if they're seeing certain things pop out, whether it's from an other rec, a counselor rec, or a teacher rec, that forms a very distinct impression of who you are. And so I'm going to be talking more in future episodes about how you can be more proactive in that process. But anyway, I just think, Dave, we're always talking about sort of the, what are seen as more academic pieces, like personal statements and extracurriculars and rec letters and test scores and transcripts and AP courses. And, you know, I just thought this was a, this was just a powerful attestation to the power character. I do. And I just want to close with saying that, no, the reality is there's a thousand and one ways to show kindness every day because it's really a character trait that we're bereft of. And when you look at high school students' challenges, what do you hear about? You hear about bullying. You hear about depression. You hear about the increasing rise of suicide rates. You hear about racism. You hear about sexism. There are so many uh, of the world's problems that are reflected in every student's high school experience that if you are a student or your child is a student who has that character kind of creative that character trait of kindness, really encourage them to actively show it. And that will show through in everything they do and people will take notice. So that's the important thing. It's hard to say, do this, and then you'll be able to write about kindness. But if you are a kind person and if you are proactive in your kindness, it will show through. You know, and you just led me to want to close with something. Let's just forget college admissions for a second. Look at how the kindness impacted the janitor, even if yeah. even if he never wrote about it. Right. So be kind because you can impact others in powerful ways, not because now you're going to come up with a you've come up with a creative hook to try to stand out in a competitive admissions pool. Do it because of the impact and influence it can have. You can literally make somebody stay. That's why I said a while ago to our listeners, if you hear an interview and you really like that interview, please send the person a one sentence note. And if you don't have their email, if it's not easy for you to find, shoot an email to us at questions at your classboundkid.com. I'll be happy to provide any email address for any interview that you really liked. Because what you don't realize is, you know, they got a lot of chaos coming at them. These are difficult jobs and you literally will make their day. That's a that's an act of kindness. Your, your, article, your interview really encouraged and inspired me. Thank you so much for what you said. And now it's time for a question from one of our listeners. Lisa, what was Missouri like? You just got back there from uh, seeing your mom. 
You know, it was good. Um, you know, we went to the city museum, which I don't know if you've ever been to the city museum, but it's a, it's all made out of like recycled and previously used materials and it's combined in this like incredibly creative, I could never think of a way, but it's also incredibly physically demanding Okay. because there's all these climbing tunnels that little so kids- So you tell me you got to work through. out? Oh my gosh. I mean, Sonia and I are getting, Sonia is getting to the point and I've been at this point, obviously, where you're just like, I'm not sure I'm going to fit in that tunnel. And the kids are like, come on, you'll lose them. You'll never see them again. It's so huge if you don't. So yeah, I have a few bruises. Um, but we did um, go by St. Louis University because it'd been a while oh, since good I had seen the campus. Any changes? Oh, since like when I last saw it in my early 20s. Yeah. Cool. Oh, is that? That's how long it's been. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've driven by it, but never been like on the campus. But it looks, they have so many new buildings there. Yeah. I mean, you can that. tell they're really putting a lot of work and money into it. Yeah, it was cool to see. Well, that's why our job never arrives. Like just when you think you know a school, it changes right. and you need to get back right. there. <laughs> but you're like super child here. So you guys don't know this, but. Lisa like visits her mom. It feels like every six weeks you're flying to Missouri to go see your mom. I get I see my mom like once a year. I feel like I'm like, like a bad <laughs> kid. <laughs> well, you know, it's being widowed and everything. You sure, know, she and my sure. dad were together for like over fifty years. So Yeah. And it still hasn't even been a full year yet, has it? No, it was a full year on the twenty first of February. Okay. But I, I was just thinking today, you know, my dad always doted on my mom. She was sure. pretty spoiled. And it seems like now she, the same thing is happening with my brother and I. We just oh. slipped right in. Like, <laughs> you're getting doted on or you're the doters? Which one? We're the doters. No, there's no doting. It's not a reciprocal <laughs> doting. So that's how I was like, huh, how does that work? You know, how well, does she manage to split with your up? brother. At yeah. Least <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Awesome. But, um, so that was a good visit. Good. Good for you. Well, let's. Uh, Dive in and take this question, and we have a second question later, but uh, we got two questions today. Go ahead, Lisa, read it for us. All right. So this question is from Shauna in North Dakota, and she asks, should students who apply early decision be encouraged to apply to several schools early action so that they have an acceptable backup if something crazy happens with a rescinded offer of admission from an ED school? How often do schools rescind their offers of admissions based on academics? If a student has one grade slip, will that be the basis to rescind? Thank you, Shauna in North Dakota. Um, there's like four questions in here, but they're all super quick, fast, and easy. So so is, should students apply to several early action schools? Yeah, students need to apply to early action when schools offer early action. Increasingly, schools are differentiating between early action applicants and regular decision applicants for the schools. There's around 300 that have early action. A lot of schools don't have that. That's, you know, about one eighth of all of the four year accredited schools out there. But for those who have it, they're increasingly noticing that students that apply early action, they yield at a higher rate. And so they've been on their mind more. They got their act together to turn everything in. And so they're not all schools. There are schools that have similar acceptance rates between early action and regular decision. But it's one of the big changes you know, that we've seen out here in the last five to 10 years. So the first part, people should just be encouraged to apply to early action anyway, regardless of if they're applying ED. Now, here's where it gets tricky. So that they have an acceptable backup if something crazy happens. So here's the challenge with that. You know, um, if, if you apply early action and you're admitted to another school and then you apply ED and you're admitted, part of that ED contract is that you have to rescind and, not, you know, you have to withdraw your applications. That's in the contract. That's signed by the parent and the college counselor and the student. Now, the one exception is if you need financial aid and you haven't gotten your aid award yet, back yet. So I do not encourage people to withdraw their applications if they need financial aid until they see that the aid award comes back. And you should have done a net price calculator for any school UED yet. And if the aid award comes back and it's similar to what the net price calculator said, then you're you're morally bound to withdraw the app. You can't sort of have the pros of ED. You got an easier admission path because of your commitment, but then you don't want to give up the trade-offs for it, which is pulling out of the process everywhere else. So it kind of doesn't work that way. Now, I can totally understand the question, which is, well, wait a minute. If I'm in ED and I pull out all from everywhere else 
and my child dips in their grades. And then the school turns around and says, well, we thought you were a three, eight type kid, four A's and a B. Now you're looking like you're three, five, you know, half A's, half B's. So we're going to rescind your offer. Now I'm like out to a Creek without a paddle. Like I've lost all my options. So it's a completely understandable question, but one, you're actually duty bound not to play it that way. But the good news is rescinding over academics is quite rare. So the question goes on to say, if there's like one grade slip, will you get rescinded? No, you will not. My experience is that most of the time when schools rescind, it's because, you know, somebody went off and did some crazy racist or homophobic thing on on the Internet or, you know, they shoplifted or something more moral in nature or character, some deep character flaw that presents them as somebody that would not be of the character that they want in their student body. There are rescinding does happen over academics. I've worked with two students in the last three years that had it happen. Now, one person called me after it happened to see what I could do, but it was a pretty egregious uh, situation there. Somebody, it was a straight A student their whole life, and they had a massive athletic hook, and they were in at Yale, and then they went to two C's. So that's pretty bad for Yale, to be straight A's your whole life and then to go to two C's. Um, And the other one was even worse. It was... Pretty much one B, almost all A's, early decision in at Pomona. And then they went to um, like three C's and a D. And so those are the cases where you typically see rescinding. It's usually more than a full letter grade drop across the board. So if you're a straight A kid, you usually would drop to like under a B average, maybe like a two eight, two five, two seven. It also depends how selective your institution is. The more selective the institution, the stricter they are. But you know, in exchange for them expecting you to pull it, they don't ding you because your grades dropped a little bit, even like a half letter grade. You know, let's say you went from like four A's and a B to like four B's and an A. Even then, I don't really see schools rescinding. Although I would be sweating that out at the most selectives, but I, I've usually only seen rescinding for at least a full letter grade drop. Thoughts, questions, Lisa? No, I mean, I think that's really good advice. Um, and it's good for people to know kind of what the scale is of um, getting an offer rescinded. So basically, it sounds like it has to be a pretty significant difference. And I suppose maybe if you had some extenuating circumstance, like you got hit by a car or something like that, and you missed some schools or classes, maybe they would, you know, and you explain that they'd be able to deal with it. But um, yeah, one question that I did have is I knew of um, a student who applied to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and she got in. And so she got in and then second semester of high school comes around. She decides, you know, AP physics is a total drag. I'm Mm -hmm. not really enjoying it. So she just drops it and takes a study hall. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess, you know, they sent some kind of quarter transcript or something to the university. And she got a call from the admissions counselor. Like, was like, what are you doing? You can't not take that class. You better, you know, get your butt in a science class right now or we're sending you. So she did. And, you know, she's happy there and it's, it's gone well, but I didn't know how often that happens. Yeah. That once again, I don't know if it was computer science. Obviously we know computer science at at U of I is like 3% acceptance. No, she was just in the undecided um, general studies program. I mean, you bring up a really good point, which is you are expected to confer with your schools if your curriculum is different than what you have presented it as being. You're expected to do that. And normally there's just no problem with that. I had several students this year that said, I, I'm going to be overwhelmed if I take this. I really don't want to take it. You know, and, and so they conferred with the school and the schools are like, no problem. And the other thing you brought up is really important, too. If you have any kind of situation where your grades are tanking, you really want to be in communication with the school and be talking them through it. Mm -hmm. And, and hopefully the reason is something other than I just stopped caring, you know, (laughs) you know, like that's not going to be, yeah, that's not really going to cut it. Now, you know, you can get misinformation on there, misperceived information. So when, when I interviewed Lisa Prescott at UCSB, um, she said that they rescind about 20 kids a year. And 
I didn't get the breakdown there, how many of them were sort of over some egregious behavior versus academic. The sense I got, though, was that a lot of them were academic. But the thing is, with the UCs, you're self-reporting your grades. And there's a very small percentage of people whose grades they self-reported don't match up when the official transcripts come in. So that's kind of its own category. Like, not many people are going to do that. It's like self-reporting your test scores, and then you're admitted, and the school asks you to submit them, and they find out they're way less. That doesn't happen that often, but believe it or not, it does happen. And so, to me, that's a different category than this. You know what I mean? Like, there's a difference mm-hmm. between you misrepresenting what you mm-hmm. your grades really were, and then when they found out what they were, they're like, okay, this isn't, this isn't going to cut it. Um, there are some people that do that, and, you know, you don't know if that's just a... A careless mistake on their part, or if they just thought that, oh, you know, I'm going to, I don't think they'll kick me out. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I don't know what's going on in their heart, but so those numbers sound high. Of course, you know, UCSB is dealing with, it's a big school, but still 20 rescinding. That's a lot um, to cancel 20 kids. I'm, I'm talking like them now. The UCs always use that term cancel. Yeah. You know, cancel it's like 20. another ex- example of cancel culture, right? You're canceled. <laughs> <Yeah>. Academically. <laughs> That's right. So, so the bottom line is um, you can't do that. You can apply EA, but you can't hold on to an EA. As be- and also the other thing I want to mention is is the timing of things too, right? So, you know, if you think you think about it, um, you know, I, actually, we have, we need to probably talk more about this at some point. I haven't talked that much I like to do something, Lisa, on mistakes, sort of ethical breaches that families do. Like one of them is what's called double depositing. That's considered a taboo to deposit at multiple places and have two pe- two different schools feel like you're both coming, you know, because you've done that. Um, the only way you could do this timing wise would be to double deposit, uh, which, you know, creates all kinds of other issues. So, but it's not anything to be concerned about because... Schools do know that senior slump does happen. Um, senioritis, senior slump, you hear different names, names for it where people taper off a little bit. And believe it or not, they're pretty understanding that, that they don't like it, but they kind of understand that it's sort of something that happens and they cut you a little slack. You know, I had a student that had that uh, three years ago got a presidential scholarship, like, you know, like it, which was everything, like full cost of attendance to a pretty selective private school. And of course, in order to get that, you know, her grades were pretty impressive. Um, I mean, it was based on leadership and everything like that, too. But she was still top two or three percent in her school. And then her grades tanked to half A's, half B senior year. So they were like freaking out because, you know, the standard for the presidential isn't just Mm -hmm. are they going to boot you out of the school? But are they going to turn around and say, look, we're giving you this full cost of attendance scholarship at this I mean, this is a school where the average kid has over a three five to get in. Mm-hmm. And now mm-hmm. you've gotten that. But they still they still honored it for her. They you know, she still she kept it and everything was good. All right, Lisa. You know what? I'm just gonna stop there. And now this week's interview with a special guest. Friends, this uh interview I feel is really powerful you're gonna hear today with with the final segment you know, with Petey, Chris Peterson, and Kellen Manning. And it's just the level of transparency that they share um, about what MIT actually looks for. They really drop the guard in a way and show some vulnerability that you don't often get um, from admission officers. And just because, you know, they're concerned about the backlash from from people. And um, appreciate it, digest it, take it in, listen and enjoy. So Abba, parent wants to know, how important are ninth grade grades? So um, I said earlier that the North Star in our process is making sure that students are well prepared um, to go into MIT. And ninth grade is a transitional point. It's the point that many students, at least in the United States, are entering high school. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a point where they're acclimating to new ways of studying and new degrees of difficulty. Um, as such, there's a lot of time after ninth grade that mm-hmm. students um, can demonstrate their competence and, and preparedness uh, for college because that's the thing that we care about. So it's really um, contextual um, on the ninth grade grades, same as the 10th grade and the 11th grade grades and everything else, um, how uh, they factor into this 
overarching question of, is this a student who's well prepared to thrive in MIT's environment? You know, we don't um, do uh, any sort of like raw GPA conversion and comparison. We don't have a standardized way of, do we consider the ninth grade grades in states that exclude them from GPA or the weighted versus unweighted GPA? It's very case by case. It's school by school, state by state. All these things vary, and it's up to us to try to understand a student on their own terms relative to this question of are they prepared for MIT? You know, I realized I missed a follow up opportunity a couple of questions ago that I can't resist. So before Peter, you'd said we've done the research, we've run the tests, we've run the numbers, we know what correlates to success at MIT. So tell us what what does correlate to success at MIT? Where does what numbers make you very nervous when you see them, and what? Um, and, and I've I've had some MIT officers share some of that information with me before privately when it comes to subject test scores. Um, now they're obsolete, of course, but. What can you tell our listeners what your research shows, what correlates to success at MIT? So in our um, our post announcing that we would be suspending our test requirement um, for another year, uh, which I'll send to you so you can include a link um, for, your, for your listeners, um, our dean talked about the fact that, um, you know, our research shows that, um, you know, there's many different things that help us pre- predict academic preparation. Not all of them are quantifiable. Um, and uh, not all of them are uh, simple things like GPAs, grades, or test scores. What we do know is that grades are not predictive on their own in the sense that straight A's um, is not predictive. If you have straight C's in math, um, then that has some predictive value. Um, but there's lots of students with good grades um, who do well at MIT, and there's other students who struggle at MIT. Um, there is some predictive utility in the standardized tests, uh, particularly in the math section. Um, and this is because everybody who comes to MIT has to take two years of post high school calculus, no matter what your major. And um, physics, that has a serious calculus component. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's no escaping a quantitative um, experience at MIT by changing into some major if you don't want to do any more math or science after high school. By the way, in the same way that if you never want to write an essay or you never want to um, do any social science, MIT is also not a good place because we have a lot of courses in that area too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Generally speaking, um, what I tell students is that if you're into the 700s on the different sections of the SAT, you're probably in the zone where we're not that worried about your um, your scores. Um, but this is research that we do every you know year. We, we do it over time. Um, we're not focused solely on the scores or the grades. Um, we're focused on everything that we can do to figure out, is this student going to succeed at MIT? And again, we I, I, I want to emphasize the tests and the grades tell us some of this, but they do not have full, full explanatory power. Right. We know that a student's non-cognitive attributes, like their grit, their resilience, their initiative, their organizational skills, all of these things matter a lot, even though they're hard to quantify. And that is, you know, the balance of the work as an admissions officer is looking at the things that you can make into numbers and looking into the things that you can't and doing your level best to make sure that a student is well prepared. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you actually sharing some numbers, just not being so completely evasive, because I'll tell you what I tell, I've been telling my students, I can look at the common data set and 100% of your students had 700s the last time you reported or higher. So that's pretty clear. It, 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 I like to show data like that to show that, look, this is just my opinion. Look at the data. Um, if you're not here, um, your chances aren't that great. And so, But I, I also want to emphasize um, that we're not aiming for the high scores for the sake of the high scores. Right. Um, that there is, our, our research shows that at the top end of the SAT math, there's not a huge um, difference between, you know, something in the high 700s and a perfect score or anything right. like that. Right, right. 
And, and so we're not, um, we're not paying attention to the tests for the test's sake. Yeah. We're, we're doing the best social science that we can mm -hmm. um, to try to make sure that students are prepared. And again, that includes many different factors of which the tests are one. I'm really glad you said that, PD, because I'll have a student that'll have a 770, you know, or 780 and they'll want to retake. And I tell them that. I say schools are not differentiating between 800 and 770 to 780. I really don't think that's good use of your time. And it, it sounds like you, you, you would concur with that, what I'm hearing you say. Absolutely. So when you have so many smart, driven kids who are used to being at the top of the class, now they come to MIT and they're in the middle of the pack or maybe even below, that could be a recipe for a mental health train wreck. What does MIT do to ensure kids are healthy mentally? I think it starts with the idea, like, like how Petey said in the beginning, there is that the, the idea of the lone genius myth and how that doesn't exist. And the and then there's also the myth that everyone does it themselves at MIT. Like MIT is a very competitive place. And that idea when actually collaboration across all aspects of MIT is very important. Like even when it comes to like the homework, we talk about this all the time with P sets, professors design P sets. So you have to do those in groups. And so as you're working and as you're struggling, you start, uh, I think the key is to be able to or the key that we push people for is to be able to ask for help to even though it might look like no one else is struggling there are a lot of people at MIT who are in the same boat as you who are who aren't doing as well there are some people who are doing great there are some people who are doing different levels so we offer tons of different uh different resources one being uh student support services which houses a lot of uh mental health and uh uh resources for students you can go in there you can talk to someone you can request extensions you can uh you can reach out to TAs. You can reach out to your classmates. There's uh, there's just a lot of resources at MIT that focus. There's also oh, was it mind, hand, and heart. Every there's so much that focuses on the idea of mental health at MIT that is very much out in the open that a lot of students are using that a lot of students champion. And it's uh, I think it comes down to the idea of we starting in high school get your student used to the idea of working with other people of not of the idea of collaboration. And it's also why on why when people ask, what are things that you can do to get an MIT? We say, challenge yourself. Because then that at the more you challenge yourself in different fields, the more you'll get used to maybe struggling a little bit or if you or working with other people or working in groups and getting used to the idea of collaborating and getting used to the idea of raising your hand and not just the, uh, and because I think those are really important parts of what we do to help MIT, whether it's the actual resources or getting them used to the idea of working in groups. In addition to what everything Kellen just said, in addition to our formal things like Mind, Hand, Heart, MIT Mental Health, Student Support Services, I just want to zone in on your question. You talk about this metaphor of being at the top of the class or the middle of the pack or below. And as I said earlier, at MIT, there's no class rank. All right. So most students don't know they, they don't have any um, any sense of where they are in a particular ranking order. Um, everybody experiences some kind of struggle. Everybody experiences some kind of potentially novel sense that, oh, crap, I'm not that good at this, <laughs> but maybe I can get better. Mm -hmm. And I do think that that has a leveling effect. And although it is a very difficult experience for students because so many students have their identity wrapped up in being an academic overachiever who's at the top of the class because that's what they were in high school. The transformation away from that as being your sole source of meaning and identity towards a different set of skills or attributes is, I believe, one of the most potentially personally transformative aspects of an MIT education. Mm. Yeah, you, you see it all the time. Like you see it like online. Like this, the moment a student realizes that getting an A doesn't matter at MIT. Mm -hmm. Sometimes getting a B doesn't and just trusting that I wouldn't pass this class if my teacher or if my department didn't believe I could do this in the field. And that's what comes to the idea of a mind in hand, like taking what you learn and learning to put it into practice. And it's just like you see the students just become liberated with that idea. Of like, I'm, it's not really about me getting an A. It's about me learning the material. Well said. Well said. This question comes from a college counselor in Washington named Jennifer. And she says, every college has its own personality. What is MIT's personality? Chaos. <laughs> you said chaos. <laughs> I did say chaos. Yes, chaos. I, I think. But it's, it's, a control, it's a controlled thing. Like, it, it feels chaotic, especially from the outside looking in. But then, but then as you start getting used to just the idea of MIT, uh, it's not nearly as chaotic as it feels like students have freedom to do different things to build 
to build different, uh, to build things around campus. You see in the different dorms, they become known for their builds for whether it's Next Haunt, which is like in Next House, one of our dorms that every year they build a two story haunted house with inside the dorm. Uh, uh, or it's like what East Campus does is the roller coasters, or you have like the theater kids, or you have the athletes. And like, so everyone's kind of doing doing their own thing, but they're also the idea of that you can take what you're learning and what you're doing and then putting it into your personal projects, whether as a group or by yourself. And just, uh, and it's just, I think it's a really cool place. Great, great, great. Awesome. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. Friends, this is a shorter episode, so I'm going to take a little bit longer than normal on my recommended resource. I'm going to walk you through the process I take a family through if they're waitlisted. So the first thing I do is I do offer empathy. Uh, I used to work for Dun and Bradstreet in the mid '90s, and they gave us empathy training, and I really learned the power and the importance of empathy. So I start out by emphasizing empathy and making them feel empathy and do it in a genuine way. Second thing I do is have a conversation with them to see is this a school they would legitimately consider over their other options, or are there's no way they're going to go to this school, but they're just curious whether or not they would get off the wait list. That's not a good enough reason. A bruised ego is not a good enough reason. If it legitimately is a school you would consider more so than your current options. Okay. Then that takes care of number two and it's all systems go and we move forward. And the third thing, which really is the recommended resource for today is we look at waitlist stats. This is extremely important. You say, where do you go? Common data set? No. We go to Dataverse, College Transitions Dataverse, waitlist stats. We're going to put the link in the show notes for you. But if you just remember one thing, just remember, look up College Transitions waitlist stats. You can put that statistics. You can put that right into Google. Why do we do that? Well, I'm just going to, starting at the letter A in the alphabet, we're going to look at the first few schools listed, and you're going to see why. So let's say you were waitlisted at Alfred University. Well, you're going to know by looking at this that they offered the waitlist to 23, 22 chose to stay on, and they admitted 19 from that waitlist. You have more than a 90% chance of getting off the waitlist at Alfred, given last year's stats. Now, there is no guarantee that this year will be like last year, but it is the best thing we have to go on. Let's go down to the next school, Allegheny. So Allegheny offered a waitlist to 20, 255 students that chose to stay on, and 10 were admitted. So now you have less than a 1 in 25 chance of getting off that waitlist. See the difference? App State, 1,434 students chose to stay on the waitlist. 1,294 got off that wait list, more than 90%, very, very similar to Alfred. So if this is the case, I'm going to communicate with the family that, look, there's no guarantee, but statistically, your odds are pretty good based on historical data. And we go down and we do that school after school after school. Brandeis, 1,553 students were waitlisted, 638 chose to stay on the waitlist, and they took nine. Nine. Nine out of 638, so 1.5% chance. Caltech, 1% chance. 501 waitlisted, they took five. Um, I look. I ran, I ran some data and looked at uh, Haverford College a few years ago. Three straight years, they took zero kids off the waitlist. So I'm going to have a conversation with the family and say, look, these are your statistical odds historically. There's a certain emotional investment when you go on the wait list. Do you really want to go through this, given the historical odds? And a lot of, most of the time people say yes. Um, well, then I say, well, then guard your heart. You need to put yourself in the mindset that it's most likely not going to happen, and you need to learn to love the school that loved you back. So then, of course, you know, the fourth thing is that you do need to read the fine print of what did the school say. And it's extremely important that you execute and exercise exactly what they told you to do. Part of 
the college admission process is a test. Can you follow the rules? And this is a big place where people don't pass the test a lot of times. There's a real tendency to want to take over and go beyond. Uh, so much so that the University of Michigan did something. And I was talking to my friend uh, Julia Esquivel this week about this. We both love what Michigan did, even that I'm a Spartan. Still got to give the blue some credit here. They literally put out in their correspondence, if you go beyond what we are telling you to do, you just hurt your chances. And that's what pretty much every school is thinking, but they don't usually say it. And so do what they want you to do. If they want you to write a statement of continued interest, then do that. If they want you to upload mid-year grades, do that. Or final grades or th th third quarter grades, whatever you get, do it. If they just want you to check a box and say you want to stay in the wait list, then do that. Follow the instructions. Nothing more, nothing less. Um, but it's very, very important that you then turn around and deposit somewhere, not holding off, waiting on the school that's on the wait list. So that's the next thing you got to do. You got to make a deposit somewhere. And you really, it's very hard. You have to learn to emotionally invest in where you're admitted. And so just assume you won't get in at these low statistic schools. It'll serve you well. Uh, but once again, this is our recommended resource, and I'm just incapable of having a really short episode without going off somewhere. But I really wanted to point to College Transitions Dataverse Weightless Statistics. It's a quick, fast, easy way to get the data. you got to dig a little bit more into the common data set. It takes a little bit longer. Um, this is fast, quick, and easy, and I highly recommend it so you can know your probability and I also encourage you to use the probability to even decide if you really, even really want to even stay on the wait list. Or, you know, if the, if you see one of these one and two and three percenters, I, I'm hoping people won't choose to stay on because I find that they oftentimes are clinging to that school and not loving the school that's loving them back and investing, emotionally investing in the place that's already embraced them. Well, now return to the final part of my interview with Petey and Kellen Manning. So how would you answer this question? MIT does an exceptional job at blank. Empowering students to take academic risks in a safe environment. Mm. I think that there's specific things that we do. You know, your first semester at MIT is graded pass or no record, meaning you either pass the class or there's no record you ever took the class. Your second semester is ABC or no record. Your entire time at MIT, the drop date for our class isn't until 10 weeks into a 14-week semester. Wow. Meaning that in the fall term, you can sign up for our class and you don't have to decide whether or not you're going to stay in the class until Thanksgiving, basically. Yeah. And that's not a withdrawing from the class. That's just dropping. It just totally goes away. Mm -hmm. Those things are all related to the mental health part, too. You could have even given those as examples of things you do to help some you know, sanity for someone that's just sinking. Absolutely. I think that generally we try to encourage our students to take risks, but part of encouraging it, students to take risks means that you have to meet them on the other side with a, with a net to catch them, you know, if they fall off the tightrope. I, 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 um, I will often use the metaphor of saying that MIT doesn't believe in training wheels, but we have a lot of crash pads. Uh -huh. You like know, that. nobody is going to hold your hand through MIT, but if you stumble, lots of people are going to reach out to catch you mm -hmm. um, in a trust fall kind of way. Mm -hmm. And these are some of the dynamics that I think um, we're, we've become pretty good at. And the nice thing about these policies is like a lot of places will have a credit limit on limiting how many classes a student can register for. And after the first year, there's no credit limit at MIT. So, there's lots of students who will try to sign up for too many classes and then in November be like, I made a huge mistake. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, they can drop those classes, no harm, no foul. But there's some students who may end up have carrying an extra class or not even numerically an extra class, but maybe they registered for a graduate class as an undergrad or maybe mm -hmm. something in a completely different field. And a little bit of extra intellectual growth every semester compounds the way that financial, you know, capital does, that little bit of intellectual capital. And so students end up on a sharper upward facing curve than they might have in a less permissive institution. You know, I think as soon as when people think of MIT, they immediately, of course, they think of people who are brilliant, but they think of 
things like computer science and they think of engineering and maybe even business. But you alluded earlier to the fact that there's some strength in other areas. I'd love for you to comment on a couple of just really strong programs that you feel fly under the radar and don't get the attention that maybe they deserve. So one of the things that MIT decided when it re-architected itself after the Second World War is that it wouldn't teach everything, but it would be world-class in the number of things that it did teach. And um, my advice to any student who's interested in studying anything at MIT um, is, and actually, frankly, at any college, and particularly if, the, if you're the sort of student who's already motivated enough to do research mm-hmm. on academics, is to go to... Um, the website of a department or a major in which you might like to study. Look at the classes that the professors are teaching and look at the research that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Because I went to UMass as an undergrad, as I said um, uh, last week, and I went to MIT for grad school. Both schools offer an undergraduate economics program and their economics programs could not be more different in the kind of economics that they teach. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that if you look at MIT's programs across the board, they're very strong for students who are interested in approaching complex topics of concern as problems that are to be solved. And um, they might deploy different kinds of problem solving methods depending on the field and discipline. But if you're the sort of student who's really into puzzles, and really into untangling complex problems and trying to figure out innovative solutions um, as your way that you work yourself through um, difficult concepts, then almost any of the things you can study at MIT are going to be approached with that mindset. Thank you. I like that broad answer. So MIT is not perfect, as you well know. No place is. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. No school is perfect. What does MIT need to improve to become an even better school. So we talked a little bit earlier about this um, kind of self-transformation for MIT Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. comes with people losing their identity as the kid who was at the top of their class and good at math and science and then having to re-architect their sense of self. And that's a really difficult experience to undertake. It is the MIT duality. It's the best and the worst thing about the place. It's the hardest thing and the most rewarding thing. I think there's been a lot of strides at MIT um, by people talking about imposter syndrome in public, um, by uh, student-run initiatives like Tell Me About Your Day, where students will wear bracelets that invite other people to talk to them about how they're feeling that particular day. Mm -hmm. But I think that anything that we can continue to do to normalize struggle as a process um, through which um, people achieve their goals rather than a sense of native natural talent that easily tap dances through the curriculum um, is important for us to continue to do. Marx wrote in the Grundrisse that there's no royal road to summit and only those who do not fear its, star- its uh, steep paths will reach its luminous summits. And I think that Anything that we can continue to do to make students can understand that that process of, you know, breaking yourself down and rebuilding it into a stronger form in the same way that it hurts to run your, your cross country races or your sore the day after you lifted a heavy weight, um, it makes you stronger and, and finding the sustainable pathway between that kind of training and not overtraining and not pushing yourself too far uh, is the central challenge for any MIT student, the central challenge for any athlete, the central challenge mm-hmm. for anyone who's undertaking any difficult project. And anything that we can do to, to make that make our students really understand that in their gut as something that they're going to go through and be out good on the other side is, is a place that we can make progress. Love it. Kellen, what do you want to add? Oh, so I think... I think the thing that MIT can improve is the same thing that every school can almost improve. Because I think at a certain point, like you have, there's always that pull between you have the young people and you have the old people, the people who are students and the people who are uh, in admin. And they both have, they both have a similar end goal in mind. They want to have 
they want to provide the best experience that they can for each other. But you kind of lose, they kind of lose each other in the way they speak. Uh, so I think that I think that the more schools can continue to have, including MIT, continue to have open conversations with each other, inviting students into these rooms and maybe being a little bit more transparent uh, as you at, as you start making decisions and then students being a little bit more open to listen to listening and on both sides. And that, uh, I think I think that's something it's the idea of of just a better communication outside of classroom, outside of direct programs and more so this is what we're doing and being more upfront about that. But but the one thing I think of when PD was bringing up his thoughts, like there was this really cool project done. It was like my first tenure at MIT. It was sometimes I think at, at MIT was a Tumblr page. It was just right. They, you saw it all over campus and it was just visit MIT sometimes I think. And then you would turn in and then a, random students or faculty or staff, they could all just send in things sometimes that they that they think about MIT. And then like a week later, it disappeared. And then in the middle of the Infinite Corridor, which is the main area, was this huge structure with every note written by everybody who submitted something, like hundreds of them. And it, was, it ran from hilarious to inane to just sometimes really sad. And just kind of, it, I felt like it was an interesting project that was completely student created that kind of got that idea across is that like people are going through things here, like even if it doesn't appear it appeared like there's a struggling thing here there's a getting a used to idea there's like the context behind where they come from and where they are now so uh i yeah i just i just thought it, i i don't know why it made me think of it i just i just really like talking about it because it's one of the coolest things i that i saw at mit but yeah guys this has been great you know wind down now but nobody gets away without uh going on our hot seat we call it the lightning round this is a little non-academic question so first questions you can't be in education but you have to have a different career, non-education. What would you do? Competitive eater. Wow, what is that? <laughs> you mean like the hot dog people? That de- yeah, like, like the hot, hot dog people. You wow. can just call me that now on the hot dog people. <laughs> Kellen, there's no way to top that, but what would you do? Oh, no, I mean, I, I would do the, I would be the, the voice dub of like some random animes. That's just would be really yeah, You guys are both creative. <laughs> there you go. All right, dear... Uh, the sport that you're best at lifting heavy things uh i was uh i played college football for it was d3 but so i guess i'd go with football yeah awesome football yeah you look like you got that football body type over there good for you good for you somebody's visiting mit and they want to go to a restaurant in the you know local area what's your recommendation man i don't even know what restaurants are open anymore after covid (laughs) but i will tell you that in the new MIT Admissions Welcome Center, um, we will have uh, a food hall adjacent to it that's going to have, I understand, food carts from basically small restaurateurs all around Boston. So I'm going to place my bet on that post-pandemic. Nice. Nice. I take them directly to Anna's Taqueria downstairs of the Student Center and just, you know, is it the best? No, but that's part of the charm of it. Will there be mice? I don't know. Possibly. But it's mice. part of the charm of MIT. You say mice? <laughs> yes, I do. First time mice has made the podcast. All right, we'll close with this. Your best advice to students and your best advice to parents. My best advice to students and parents is basically what I said earlier. I wrote a blog post 11 years ago called Applying Sideways, which was advocating for people that you should approach the process just trying to Be a hardworking, nice student and good community member, apply to college and see what happens rather than try building your whole high school experience around trying to get into a particular college. Mm -hmm. And I stand by it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's just the idea of enjoy your time. Like don't center so much around like what happens next, because eventually there'll be nothing next. So mm-hmm. just enjoy that time and then try your best, be kind, all the things. And then whatever happens after that happens, like that's probably my favorite quote it's from Cowboy Bebop, but whatever happens, happens. And then just enjoy that and live in the, that moment. No, no. You know, I tell people, um, I mean, if you have to become an imposter and get a facelift to try to get into the school, I mean, do you really, do you really want to go to a place where you have to fake who you are in order to get mm-hmm. in? And that's what I'm hearing from Petey and, and um, hearing from Callan, look, um, enjoy the ride. Don't overly stress out. It's all going to work out in the end. You know? So closing, guys, um, share the MIT website and the social media that you recommend a student go to if they want to learn more about MIT. 
You can read about MIT at mitadmissions.org, where we have been blogging continuously since 2004. Yeah, blogs are a great place on the website. Also, at MIT student, at, no, not you know, go to at MIT students. Uh, that's the student life channel. It's it's every single week a different student takes over the account and they show with their experience they answer questions. It's a great account. Um, also, at MIT admissions, uh, that's the admissions account. And that's where eight students are kind of just kind of going through their journey and uh, of whatever is going to happen. There'll be lives. We'll post things there. I think that I think that's it. I mean, also check out. Check out the the MIT website. It's cool. Like and what what PD said. Go to all the different departments. Like whether it's humanities or mechanical engineering. Check out everything and just see what you're interested in and just go there. But yeah. Hey guys, thanks a lot. You've been most generous with your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Next week in the news, merit aid or the lack thereof makes early decision even murkier. An interesting article by Ron Lieber of the New York Times. Our question from a listener is bonus content week. Lisa looks at how accommodations for IEPs and 504 plans differ from college to high school. What you need to know to set your child up for a successful transition. Our interview is part one of two with Chris Gruber, the Vice President and Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid at Davidson College on... How the pandemic forced Davidson to examine its own admission biases and make changes. And our college spotlight is Understanding Danish Universities with International Specialist Kevin Newton, Part 1 of 2. So I'm going to tune in for this one because you know, Mark, I love college spotlights that focus on um, international opportunities because I think they're so fascinating. Yeah, you're still talking about uh, London Metropolitan. Yeah, London <laughs> Metropolitan, that you absolutely. Like. Awesome. Well, friends, remember, college is not a prize to be won, but a match to be made. It's not where you go, but it's what you do when you get there, and it's what you do when you get out of there. See you next week. See you next week, folks. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please subscribe so you get every episode as soon as it is released. If you are interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on your favorite podcast listing app. I am the producer of the Your College Bound Kid podcast. We have a fantastic team of nine people. Shout out to our co-host. Dr. David Williams, and Dr. Lisa Ruff. Our sound engineer who fixes all of our many errors is Nemanja Modfitch. The amazing music you hear is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Boss. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joy Stucker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Dalianas Dimitri. If you want to have a college coaching session with me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want to ask or a college you want Lisa or me to do a spotlight on, or if you have a recommended resource or an article you think we should share, just send it to questions at your collegebondkid.com. By the way, check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is yourcollegeboundkid.com. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you, our family, next week.